At a ferry port on the north coast of Cebu, hundreds are fleeing the aftermath of a super typhoon. We're going against the tide. Five days on, we're heading to some of the smaller islands ravaged by the worst storm in memory. Also making the trip are exhausted and worried relatives trying to find their loved ones. This part of the Philippines has had little attention from the media or even the government, but that's not surprising. This is a nation of 7,000 islands, of which 2,000 are inhabited. The typhoon caused such widespread damage that some areas are just starting to get help. The former governor, Gwen Garcia, has been trying to bring relief here for days. She's finally managed to get a truckload of rice onto the ferry. This is the first time that we've had such a terrible typhoon such as this. Yeah, so this area got the full force of the typhoon. That's right. And since the, the typhoon or the super typhoon was moving northwards, this area, which is the northernmost part of the province, got really, really hit very bad. The Philippines has always suffered violent storms. But Typhoon Haiyan, known here as Typhoon Yolanda, was off the scale. It came out of the northwest Pacific, and when it made landfall, it was the strongest wind ever recorded. It bore down on the crowded city of Tacloban, bringing a surge of seawater that demolished buildings and killed thousands. The cyclone continued across this impoverished archipelago, slamming into island after island, destroying whole towns, tearing their flimsy dwellings apart. By the time it was over, the disaster zones stretched hundreds of kilometres across land and sea. Our destination, Bantayan Island, was directly in the path of the eye of the storm. We arrived to find more people trying to flee. This was a tourist destination and home to 130,000 people. But all we see now are the remains of hotels, businesses and houses amid trees that were snapped like matchsticks. I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's beyond words. People don't have shelters, they don't have homes. It's shattered homes, shattered lives. At the town hall, there's a flurry of activity. Have you had any help from the outside? Very little, very little. Because... The mayor, Chris Ascario, is coordinating the little relief there is. We really need help from the outside. Yeah. Because uh, most of the attention is Tacloban and other places. We know they really need the help, but we need the help also. So far, almost all the help has come from private groups, and everything's had to be trucked in on ferries. This might look like a lot, but it has to feed 100,000 people on Bantayan and all the smaller islands around it. Internet and phone lines are cut, and there's barely enough fuel to run a generator. So are people hungry? Are they thirsty? They're really hungry, and uh, our fi uh, five island barangays don't have water now. Despite the island having a functioning airstrip, Mayor Ascario has given up hope of help from the central government, which is trying to deal with what's effectively a multiple catastrophe. Each island is a disaster in itself. Whatever comes in, we'll have, be happy to receive it. Well, I'm bringing in at least 50 bags of rice. To help. Yes, thank you. Even in the midst of awful human suffering, grubby politics may be in play. 
Gwen Garcia was Cebu's governor for three terms and now sits with the opposition in the National Congress. She suspects local party bosses are withholding relief supplies from areas that voted against them. I've been going to the other towns that were affected too and I've seen a pattern. It seems that those towns where the mayor belongs to the ruling party, they get all of this uh, help. Those who are not aligned with the administration, they get a measly token of help. The government denies favoritism. With as many as 10 million people affected in 44 provinces scattered across the islands, anyone would struggle. But many believe the relief effort has been chaotic, uneven and grossly inadequate. It's getting cruel in this particular case. Hunger and sickness, even death, do not choose whether you're aligned with a political party or not. Buntayan was still recovering from a severe typhoon that hit two years ago. The damage forced fishermen and businesses to take out heavy loans, especially in the island's main industry of egg production. Most are still paying them off. Nobody expected an even greater typhoon to hit so soon. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the mayor's cousin, Vince Scario, who's helping coordinate relief, says even the island's elders couldn't believe the storm's fury. We've had pretty strong typhoons in the past, but never of this kind. A lot of people who live in the islands thought that they would weather the storm, they could weather the storm. But obviously, from what you see, we were all wrong. The astonishing destructive force of the typhoon can only be sensed from on high. This is different. This is 275 kph wind bringing with it water and sand. So you can imagine how massive a force that was. ripping off houses, flattening them out, bringing building structures down. Up to four million Filipinos have been left homeless. It's going to take years and billions of dollars to rebuild. But there are fears this devastation could be a sign of things to come. Have you ever, ever seen a storm like this before? Nakakita na nakasinati kasang bagyo nga ama sini kakusog sa una. Dawa patingali sir kay daw bata bata pamtingali ko. He says he hasn't he hasn't experienced a storm of this magnitude because he's still a little he's still a bit young. <laughs> Here they're more worried about outsiders encroaching on their fishing grounds than scientific concerns about climate change. Some people talk about global warming. Have you heard about global warming and have you seen any changes in the in the climate? <laughs> While the islanders sifted through the rubble from the storm, politicians 10,000 kilometres away argued over its significance. A Filipino delegate made this impassioned plea to the UN Climate Change Conference in Warsaw. Mr. President, I speak for my delegation, but I, I speak 
speak for the countless people who will no longer be able to speak for themselves after perishing from the storm. I speak also for those who have been orphaned by the storm. We can take drastic action now to ensure that we prevent a future where super typhoons become a way of life. It's impossible to say with certainty if global warming affected this typhoon. But most scientists predict rising temperatures and sea levels will bring greater storms and sea surges. The islanders already face a worsening environment, not just because of climate. The fishing grounds have become much, much farther. They no longer fish nearby because there's nothing to catch at all. They used to see really big fish species around, but they're all gone. So life has become really hard for them. The weather dictates um, their catch and what they eat every day. And because the weather changes have been very, very strange and unpredictable, their catch and their livelihood has become unpredictable as well. Across Bantayan, the community is working hard to clear the wreckage and rebuild. But some things will never be made right. This is what's left of the house Josephine Casper shared with her husband of 21 years, Pedro. He died when a wall collapsed on top of him. I tried to, to ask help, but the wind was so fast. I lost my house, I lost my husband, I lost everything. Then I, I do not, I, I don't know where I, where, where I start. Everything lost. Any children? No children. That's why I said it's very, it's very painful for me because I don't have child, I don't have children. I lost everything. Sa pagbunyad, namatay si Oban ni Cristo, maban haong ta siya uban kaniya. Hinumdumi usab ang among mga igsuon nga nagamatay. Her neighbor has given her clothes, shelter, and a place to farewell her husband. In the local tradition, there's an open casket and a long wake of singing and praying before the funeral service. This mass was one of many on the island, but Bantayan was spared the horror of other towns where thousands died. So far, this community has lost 21 people. In part, it's because the local government took seriously the warning of a Category 5 typhoon and tried to move everyone to shelters. But it soon became clear that all the preparations meant little against the might of Typhoon Haiyan. This is what happened to one evacuation centre, a sports hall. It's a story repeated across the island. <laughs> Amelie Limpangog is staying with her children at their local primary school. It's become a temporary refuge for dozens of homeless families. She and her mother-in-law, Marita, feel lucky to be alive. The school was also an evacuation centre, but during the typhoon, it started to tear apart around them. Kasilias na nang ini kuan ba kanang CR ito minenago kay ang kuan ang bintana buak naman ang bintana 
kami na malhin kami dito pag kaw mo pamalhin naglungag ni kay usawa kami sudan sa mong kalisod kay wa kami sinina mo sinina basa kayo mga bata nagkurug kurug tapos mga bata nang alisang nang adlok kay kung nanon ma magatingog na sin mahadlok makudag man In the end, it wasn't good preparation that spared the massive casualties. It was an accident of fate. The islands are surrounded by tidal flats. The typhoon struck at low tide when the sea was hundreds of meters from the shore. The sand and mud stopped the storm wave. And that is what saved Bantayan. The wind was devastating, but it was the sea surge driven by the storm that posed the greatest danger. If the typhoon had struck at high tide just a few hours later, this whole community could have been wiped out. Vince Scario believes Bantayan was blessed. He's a former seminarian. Like many in this devoutly Roman Catholic country, he's been giving thanks for deliverance. It could have wiped out the entire island. If, if the tide was high at the time, not a single building would be seen today and not a single soul would be on this island now. So we have to go outside for us to be able to go in. He took me on an outrigger boat to some of the stricken smaller islands. He was shocked by the state of them. This was a beautiful, beautiful place before the typhoon hit. This area here was a thick forest of ipil-ipil trees, so thick that sunlight could hardly penetrate into the canopy of trees. And now all you see is a parched land. The villagers are glad to see us. They don't even have drinking water. Not only is the power out, the storm destroyed the water pumps. This fishing village suffered even more damage than towns on the main island. Though there's no sign the kids mind just yet that their school was blown away. What you see now are just the uh, service boats. Yeah. Um, the big boats that they really use for fishing and for other uh, livelihood are all gone. all gone. Despite the destruction, the islanders are already getting back to work. People here are determined to continue living by and from the sea. But even before the typhoon, life in this fishing community was getting ever harder. We are right in the middle of the Philippine archipelago. The Spaniards called us Madre de los Pescados, Mother of the Fishes, because back in the 15th century, this island was surrounded by coral reefs. But now they're all gone. Coral bleaching, overfishing, warming of the waters. We were once called the mother of the fishes. That title does not belong to us anymore. And it will never be again. Vince is normally a business and tourism consultant trying to build up employment on the islands. He worries how small communities here can survive if, as most scientists agree, the climate really is warming. It's a question of funding, first and foremost. People here have existing loans they even haven't paid for yet. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, with this destruction and devastation, where do they get the money? Will the government provide them with cash? Will banks come in and help them? And with the question of climate change, more storms, bad fishing, there's no hope for these people. And there seems to be no answer to that question, where do we get money to rebuild our lives? Climate change affects us directly because we are surrounded by water. The sea defines who we are. If you have storms like this becoming more and more frequent, we might as well vacate and look for a much better place on this earth because certainly there won't be any future to look forward to. 
Our island tour is cut short by a medical emergency. This old man seems to have suffered a stroke. His distraught wife asks if we can take them to Bantayan Hospital. As we sail back, she can barely get out her story. She tells us they had just been to town to try to get supplies, but as soon as they returned to their ruined house, he collapsed. Their children are not here, they're all in Manila, and she says that they couldn't find help from anyone, so they've had to survive on their own, just the two of them. He's slightly better by the time we reach Bantayan Wharf. Perhaps it wasn't a stroke after all, just the overwhelming stress of the past few days. By day nine, large-scale relief is finally coming through. Businesses and private charities have stepped in to fill the vacuum of government. It's not enough food for everyone, but it's enough to keep hope alive. Today, Marita and her daughter-in-law, Armeline, are moving their family back home. They live next door to each other in a small shantytown behind the ruined school. Marita's husband is a carpenter. In little more than a week, he's managed to repair most of the storm damage to the houses. Yet Armeline's deeply worried about her daughters. Hello, girls. Oh, a bit shy. Yeah, what are their names? Princess. Princess, yes. Diane Rose. Diane Rose and Princess. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah, they yeah. seem cheerful enough, but the memory of that terrible day is always with them. For now, they're getting on with the business of living. That means making money to feed their children. While the men look for work outside, the women spend the days making candles. They try to sell them at the main church for five pesos each. That's about nine cents a candle. With luck, it will be enough for tomorrow's meals. Ang mga malumok kasing kasing magiluy on baserba mo nga. Kinsa katong mga makakita namong sa among situation dire maloy on tasya sa among bisang ginagmay lang ilabi nagit tung ako mong mga kaliwat nga nakikita namong nga mao amo ang kahimpang magtawag usay kami usay guay mo hatagwan di one it basta ang buo lang ang among pamilya. Vince Ascario has worked round the clock to help bring in relief, never once losing his cheer. We had to organize ourselves. We had to make that tough decision to stand up on our own two feet. But something changes when he takes me to another church that was opened just months ago. The statues are intact, the roof has gone, and unexpectedly, Vince's stoic mask slips. There is no typhoon strong enough to bring us down, and we will rise again. To see what was once a beautiful island suffer such devastation, when there is no hope, seemingly, coming, but to see your ordinary neighbors, 
ordinary people with very little in life, but so much richness in spirit and in love. What greater power is there than that? The island's main church has been here for 150 years, built from the very coral that surrounds the shore. It's twisted and shattered, but still standing strong. For centuries, the people of Buntine have endured natural disasters that were once called acts of God. The next generations may also face the legacy of acts of man. If we are to look forward to the future, we have to take things into control. We have to control how we live and live more responsibly and be real stewards of this island. That kind of future, unfortunately, is not in our hands. That kind of future is in the hands of the much bigger, more powerful, more developed nations. We just can't continue to be irresponsible and suffer this kind of fate that we are suffering today.